We'd like to welcome you back to our current event in weekly Bible study for March 11th, 2012. This is part two, and we're going to be continuing along in a very similar theme as part one. This is entitled Big Brother Propaganda, Sovereign Citizens, Radicals Exercising God-Given Rights or Fueling Domestic Terrorism. This is from ABC News, a small report, and then I'm going to play the tape, and then we're going to comment on it as well. So, we will do that now. Living outside the law, they are the anti-government extremists next door who believe the laws don't apply to them. No driver's licenses, no taxes. And according to a report out today, these types... Notice how she broad brushes everything. No no laws apply. No driver's licenses, no tax. She's just trying to paint anyone who would be anti-government in the most extremist of the radical of the radical. And, and, And again, what ends up happening is, is anybody of any varying degree along those lines, would also get lumped in with that group. Why? Because it's so convenient. It's a way to demonize large sections of humanity uh, with, you know, the most radical elements possibly of that group. And you see a lot of this in the modern modern day media. So so so-called hate or anti-government groups grew explosively last year in the U.S. One of the biggest jumps... Seemingly average people who call themselves sovereign citizens, a loose confederation of Americans who can turn violent and have. Here's ABC's Dan Harris with tonight's Nightline Investigates. The federal government considers them a, quote, extremist anti-government group. I hereby challenge this court's jurisdiction as a sovereign. I am not an American citizen. I do not recognize these. I am my counsel. Sovereign citizens, people who believe the laws of America do not apply to them. They have their own driver's licenses. They have their own hunting licenses. They have their own pistol permits. Violence has gotten this group a lot of attention, but these incidents are really just the tip of the iceberg. This is a movement estimated to be 300,000 strong and growing in every state in America, whose members argue they are really patriots, defenders of... And as the government gets more and more rogue, there's going to be more and more sections of the population that feel compelled to join this particular movement. Of course, the vast majority of them aren't doing what is being pictured in this video where they're going out getting in gun battles with cops. But that's the only, those are going to be the poster children for the media to represent this group, the most radical, whereas a Muslim can go and kill and and, and strap on nail bombs, and you're only going to hear typically about how they're a religion of peace. Even though the reports will appear where they killed this or they killed that, it's just, okay, let's ignore that and go on to the next, let's go on to the next story. You know, as though, oh, well, that, you know, we, we don't want to associate that with being a Muslim, though. They were just terrorists. Well, the reality is, is it's all lumped together. So, this is how the New World Order media does things. Freedom in a country with an increasingly tyrannical government. To find out if these people are motivated by love of liberty, or, as their critics say, by greed, anarchy, and bloodlust, Nightline went deep inside a notoriously press-shy movement. We started here at a diner outside Tampa, Florida. Hey, everybody. How's it going? The first impression was striking. These are not what many of us would expect anti-government extremists to look like. They're diverse, middle class, educated, and convinced that the government is out of control. Uh, the government is out of control. These are all, all well-dressed, uh, average-looking people. Actually, they look a little more like almost like business-like people. These are people that have just figured out, you know, obviously like we, the situations we look at every week and the the news stories we look at every week, they figured out that the government's totally out of control, totally rogue, and they're, and they're starting to band together in order to, um, you know, their strength in numbers and in order to compare notes and in order to, you know, uh, obviously if everybody's splintered, You know, that's not typically a good thing. So they're coming together and trying to figure out solutions to a lot of the uh, problems that they're facing. 
and I'm thinking false arrest, but he tightened up by two clicks, two tights. I brought my right hand up. I said, hold on, hold on, man. I said, you got to loosen up this cuff. You're cutting off my circulation. How dare them? How dare them? Most insisted they are nonviolent, but not all of them ruled it out. They set up to be nonviolent. It's not going to get you anywhere. I don't want to come here with this bull crap about trying to impress the news, impress ABC News about how friendly we are. I don't give a crap how friendly anybody is. If they come at me with a gun, I got a gun too. Okay, that's what I'm about. See, but, but again, that's who they're going to want to try. Every other person there, you know, was being real calm. And the one guy that, that spouts off, that's how they're really going to want to try to represent the movement, where people are just, you know, itchy trigger fingers and they're just out to, you know. <laughs> but again, that's, that's just demonization that they're famous for. Next, we found ourselves at this small church in Center Point, Alabama. Donald Joe Barber, the pastor here, invited us inside for a rare look at a meeting with his congregation of sovereigns. In your view, do you need to have a driver's license? No. Do you need to have license plates? No. What about taxes? Income tax? No. Why not income tax? Because I'm not, I don't live in the United States. Where do you live? I live in the nation Alabama. If you are described as a domestic terrorist in any, any agent... And again, somebody hears that, they're not going to have a clue what he's actually talking about. Okay? And you could probably do a 10-part teaching on why he believes what he believes. Okay? But the average person is just going to think he's a nutcase. And again, that's how they want to portray it. They just... They give a very small sliver of the story to paint the movement in the worst possible light and then they just move on and then demonize the whole thing like they're just a bunch of... Of uh, crazy people. You see, can come and arrest you for domestic terrorism. They can put you away in some holding place until you die under that law. So the way you describe it, this government is totally it, out of control. Absolutely. You think we're living in a police state right now? Yeah. Why do you Why do you think so? Well, they think they have all the rights, and you have none from the beginning. Barber, who is a former photocopier salesman, has made himself into a scholar of sovereign ideology. A bizarre hobbling together of passages from obscure law books, along with parts of the Constitution and the Bible, all to justify flouting the law. People all over the country are now using sovereign theories to justify failure to repay their debts and even to occupy foreclosed homes. And when police, prosecutors, and judges stand in the way of a sovereign like Donald Barber, they often resort to a classic sovereign weapon called paper terrorism, flooding officials with paperwork. Donald Barber demanded money from this judge. It was a demand for $4 million uh, in gold. Filed a $15 million lien against this judge. Were you angry? I was went ballistic. Of course I was angry. And Barber sent a letter to this police now, And again, judge, the judicial system, the judges in particular, are some of the most wicked, evil, Masonic factions of our government. I, I've seen that firsthand. I mean, bought and paid for, for the most part. Or can be bought and paid for. And therefore, what they're trying to do is give them a taste of their own medicine. Which I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But they're incensed when, you know, that happens to them. These black robe devils, as I like to refer to them as, but you know they get a little taste of their own medicine. They can't handle it. And again, the whole movement's demonized because you're only getting one side of the story. Jeep saying you better get out of Dodge while the getting is good because a new sheriff is about to ride up on you. You're worried that maybe they are going to follow through with, in all accounts, as a kidnapping threat, or are they going to come after your family even? Benjamin Franklin stated that. There should be a revolution every 20 years. Okay, we're a long time past due. Do you think we need a revolution now? I think we need a revolution, but not a, a violent one. Oh, oh, oh. Sovereign citizens do have a history of turning violent. Terry Nichols, co-plotter of the Oklahoma City bombing, a sovereign... The Oklahoma City bombing, the one that the government totally rigged and planned. I mean, there's all kind of videos up on the internet. It's just like 9-11. It's as much of a hoax or a bunch of garbage, is 9-11, uh, these terrorists with box cutters getting on a plane and, and precisionally flying them into uh, the, the Trade Center towers, and then them 
imploding one on top of one another like a controlled demolition from the actual airline fuel melting the steel structure. It's absolute, total insanity. Same thing with Oklahoma City. Okay, Same lie, same garbage, but again, they want to demonize certain sects of the population and they use them as scapegoats. Prince Citizen. Did you see the plane before impact or were you completely caught off guard? Joe Stack, who flew his small plane into an IRS building in Austin, Texas, a sovereign citizen. And then there's Jerry and Joe Kane, a father and his 16-year-old son, who used to drive around the country teaching people how to use sovereign legal theories to get out of debt. I don't want to have to kill anybody. But if they keep messing with me, that's what it's going to have to come out. When they were pulled over in West Memphis, Arkansas in 2010... Joe Kane burst out of the car with an assault rifle and killed two officers. Oh, my God. The yeah, Kane- and this happens all the time. I mean, just, you know, there, there's bodies littered everywhere, all over the... The Muslims, like I said, they can go and kill... That's okay. They can kill hundreds a day. They can fire rockets into Israel. They're, they're not demonized. They're, they're religion of peace. We work with them to bring about change in the Middle East and to bring about what. But these guys, and this is such a fringe, tiny little minority of this movement that is doing this. But again, that's who you're going to see portrayed. It's total, 100% hypocrisy. These were later cornered and shot to death in the parking lot of a Walmart. A call comes over my radio that says an officer down. And then it says two officers down. Police Chief Bob Powder rushed to the scene. So as I run up the hill, and one of my sergeants stopped me and, and says, Chief, please don't go up there. But well, I knew then it had to be Brandon. Brandon, the chief's son and fellow officer, was dead. It was the most horrific day of my life. I've never experienced any kind of pain like that. Had you ever heard of sovereign citizens before? I had never heard the term sovereign citizens. Okay, we got sovereigns. What are we going to do? Now Bob Powder travels the country teaching local law enforcement officials about sovereign citizens. Because they're the terrorists. We found two irreconcilable views of this movement. Donald Joe Barber, about to go on trial for allegedly threatening government officials and facing decades in prison, casts sovereignty in a heroic light. Just as a, a soldier goes over to Iraq or to Iran or any other country to fight a battle, he's going over there because he loves his country. I can't do any less. But for Bob Powder, who lost his son, sovereign citizens are domestic terrorists who must be stopped. The pain is still there. It will always be there. But it certainly gives me satisfaction knowing that probably we're saving lives, that some other family won't have to go this. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Tampa, Florida. So remember, they're domestic terrorists. That's what they want to leave you with a taste in your mouth. That's the case. That's the case. financial advice. Back then, he- so that's that's exactly the type of information that they want to convey. They're the terrorists. And again, then you can just group anyone else that would believe, take a strong stance on the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, or that would be, obviously, this movement tends to be very conservative. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of uh, biblical tenets are interwoven in with it. Uh... I'm not a member of any type of group like that, but I've got I've had a lot of exposure to them over the years. Uh, my dad had a lot of um, dealings, not not in any kind of militaristic like where they were lock and load lock and loaded and that type of stuff where they were, but with legal stuff he tried to use these groups, and so I've had a high level of experience been to those types of meetings before. And again, there's a lot of different flavors to uh, most of the meetings I've ever been to were almost of a business-like, they they had no military overtones at all. It was all legally how to defend your own rights, um, how to resist tyranny, these types of things, which are good things. Uh, what I found, though, unfortunately, is that the government is so rogue, so legal, and they make up the rules as they go in many aspects 
of the judicial system, particularly the IRS, that it doesn't really matter what you do because the, the, the deck is so stacked against you and they use a rubber ruler. So no matter what you do, you're going to lose most of the time if you try to fight them on a legal basis. That's been my experience. Uh, saw my dad go through 10 years of it and not get anywhere trying to get a $2 million, $2.5 million company that was stolen from him back. It was his own company. But they had 50 attorneys, and they bought all the judges off. And I mean, literally, I found out, I mean, this was exactly the case. They had actually flown a federal judge in, a very famous one, just to rule against my dad. And he ultimately lost his company and, you know, pretty much died penniless. Uh, and the company was stolen from him, and it was all legal. So again, they frameth mischief by a law. It's very commonplace. In this country. And a lot of people are fed up with it. And this is why groups like this spring up. Because they've been, they've seen the injustices. They've been done so many injustices, they start to fight back. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong to resisting tyranny. Is it better just to let it steamroll you? And and, and just to let it evil overtake you? And let darkness overtake you? And do nothing? I don't see any Bible for that. The apostles and Jesus Christ were constantly fighting evil. If you think about it, that's what they did. They fought evil. They exposed evil. Jesus Christ rebuked the Pharisees and Sadducees and called them serpents and vipers, white and sepulchers full of dead man's bones. He exposed evil. Why? Because if you go in particular pharisaical or sadducical religious system or whatever, you know, it's it, they had added so much to at that time the Old Testament Levitical tenets, and and it was a, it was a form of bondage. You know, they had added to the Word of God. So Jesus is going to warn regarding that particular thing, and uh, going further. And I just I, I wanted to add this in. It says if you think the IRS is lawful and that your income tax goes to running the United States. Because people say, oh, you, you don't pay taxes. You know how many taxes we pay on a almost everyday basis that are built into bills, built into gas, property taxes, sales tax. There are so many taxes we end up paying in America. But of all the taxes that are out there, the IRS is the only one that seems to count. Because people will say, oh, well, if somebody um, has an issue with the IRS, they'll say, well, you don't, you don't want to pay your taxes. You don't want to do this or that. The thing is, is we're paying so many different. And in the movie, it's called Freedom to Fascism. Aaron Russo made this. And uh, he was dead not too long after this movie came out, coincidentally enough. Uh, he documents this whole phenomenon in, in the uh, illegality of the IRS. And the fact that... Um, <laughs> probably the most rogue aspect of what would be called U.S. government, even though they're really um, not even part of the government. We're going to just talk about that real soon here. Anyway, it's a link. It's uh, a very pretty long video, but it, they have a section on there that shows you all of the different ways we're taxed. I mean, and it, it's, a, it's, it's mind-boggling how many different ways. Those are the actual taxes that run the co country. But as we're going to see now, the, the um, well, let me just start this. Where do the income taxes that are collected actually go? In 1982, President Ronald Reagan formed the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control, an independent panel of 160 of the country's top business leaders, headed by Peter Grace, also known as the Grace Commission, in order to find out ways to cut federal spending. In their report submitted to President Ronald Reagan on January 15, 1984, this Blue Ribbon panel stated the following, Quoting directly from page 12 of the report, quote, Resistance to additional income taxes would be even more widespread if people were aware that one-third of all their taxes are consumed by waste and inefficiency in the federal government, as previously identified, with the other two-thirds of everyone's personal income taxes wasted or not collected. 100% of what is collected is absorbed solely by the interest on the federal debt. 
In other words, all individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services taxpayers expect from the government. Meaning, not one dime of what you pay into the income tax system goes to running one iota of anything going on in this country. Nothing. You might as well flush your money down the toilet. More facts regarding the IRS. Number one, the IRS is not a U.S. governmental agency. It is an agency of the International Monetary Fund. Now, all of this is referenced. All I'm giving you this is referenced in law. And I give you the references there. Number two, the IMF, which which the IRS is an agency of the I, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is an agency of the United Nations. Imagine that. So the IRS, which is basically uh, an agency of the International Monetary Fund, is actually an agency of the United Nations. Imagine that. The United Nations. Satan Central, essentially. Number three, the U.S. has not had a treasury since 1921, The U.S. Treasury is now the International Monetary Fund. So, what's the big deal about the Fed, uh, or the Federal Reserve? For starters, it's not, contrary to popular belief, a part of the government. It's privately owned, which means the United States does not control its own money supply. It's privately owned by privately owned banks. It was started in 1913, okay, through corrupt political business dealings, I believe by Woodrow Wilson. Sold the country out. The the money started to be issued by a, the Federal Reserve, which is a privately owned banking system that's owned by the International Monetary Fund, which essentially is owned by the, the United Nations and the 13 families of the Illuminati. The Fed was created around the same time the U.S. adopted such charming practices as taxing the income of working people and conscripting its citizens against their will to fight and die in overseas wars that were created by the Illuminati. Who really rules America? It's not who you think. And there's a whole uh, little video here you can watch. It's called Watch Money is Debt. And it's a whole little video. It tells you how the whole monetary system is so incredibly corrupt. It is a absolute system of unjust scales and balances, which, according to these Bible verses I'm going to be reading, is an abomination to God. Proverbs 11, verse 1 says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Meaning, a false, okay, you go, in in ancient times, you go and you want to uh, trade with somebody. And let's say you've got, you're trying to buy, um, I don't know. You're trying to sell your your rice or wheat or whatever. And they use, they have the scale, you put whatever you've got on the scale, and then they put their counterweight, which supposedly weighs a certain amount. Okay? And they can either use a weight that's that's, um, too light or too heavy based on if it's going to give them an advantage. Okay, in the marketplace, it's 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 illegal. It's like stealing. Okay, that's what the what that's what God means when He says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, because that's the way in ancient times they did business through balances. Okay, but a just weight is His delight. Meaning, if it weighs one pound, it should be one pound, but it might say one pound and be one point five pounds, or it might say, let's say for argument's sake, ten pounds. And be 10.5 pounds. Because obviously you, you can't be too flagrant with the weight differential. But it's it may be labeled 10 pounds, but it really is 11. Or it may be labeled 10 pounds, or it really may be 9. It depends on how it's going to be an advantage for you know the person trying to steal whatever you're trying to sell. Proverbs 16.11 A just weight and balance are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his work. Proverbs 20, 23, divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. Well, when you read, when you watch this video called Money is Dead, it's, it's here on page 5 of the, uh, for the PDF for uh, March 11, 2012 on contendingfortruth.com, you'll understand how unjust a monetary system we actually have. It is 
totally corrupt, evil, with nothing backing the money. They print the money out of thin air. We've been off the gold standard since 1933 and totally off the silver standard really since around 1968. It's the last time I believe they had really had any kind of silver in coinage. Fort Knox is empty. I'd almost guarantee you that. There's nothing backing the money. They just print it out of thin air. You know, so that that system is is totally corrupt and totally unjust. Going further, one of the last things John F. Kennedy did before he was assassinated was declare his intention to reform the central banking system of the United States. I'm sure there's no connection between his assassination and these events. Now, he was trying to do a lot of other things, too, that I think could have got him assassinated, but that would have been one of the main ones. Congressman Louis McFadden, chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee from 1927 to 1933, opposed the Federal Reserve System. Uh, There were three reports reported attempts on his life before he finally died of, quote, heart failure. Here's what he said about the Federal Reserve from the Congress floor. Congressman Louis McFadden, Chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee. Okay, here's what he said. Mr. Chairman, we have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, therein after called the Fed. The Fed has cheated the government of the United States and the people of the United States out of enough money to pay the nation's debt. The depredations and iniquities of the Fed has cost enough money to pay the national debt several times over. This evil institution has impoverished and ruined the people of the United States, has bankrupted itself, has has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the defects of the law under which it operates. Through the maladministration of the law by the Fed and through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. End of quote. And the, and the IRS is the private debt collection arm for the Federal Reserve, which is owned essentially by the IMF, which is owned by the United Nations and the Illuminati. So you see how wicked and evil? <laughs> We're talking maximum wicked, evil system. Fed, IRS, you know, the um, United Nations, International Monetary Fund, and the Illuminati. All one big happy family of slimy snakes. That's what you've got. So I just wanted to, to, to touch on that um, before we go to the next topic here. Okay, so on to the next subject here. This is entitled, I've, I've got a, a many requests on this over the years, uh, Biblical Resistance to Tyranny. Now, I'm not going to be doing a study on this today. Because um, I'm going to be giving you two different audio teachings and and also a study on, it's called Christian Pacifism, that you can look at. I can't do a better job than Pastor John Weaver did on this subject. He did a two-part teaching, just brilliant, absolutely brilliant on this particular subject. It's called The Biblical Doctrine of Self-Defense, Parts 1 and 2, and they're... 170 minutes and 171 minutes, and I can't do a better job explaining this than he can. Uh, and then also then a whole separate study from a verbal standpoint, or from a, uh, a text standpoint on Christian pacifism. Uh, the Bible says protection of our families is part of providing for our families. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially they of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. In the context of this verse, the Noah Webster 1828 Dictionary defines the word provide as, quote, provide, to procure supplies or means of defense, or to take measures for counteracting or escaping an evil. That's what that means. So, I'm not going to say a whole lot more about that, because again, the stu- don't, you're, if, if you want to argue about that, that's fine. But listen to the study and, and uh, I'm not going to get into a big debate with people about this. I really believe that from a biblical standpoint, I've never seen a better job done of explaining this particular subject from a biblical standpoint than Pastor John Weaver did in this 141 minute uh, study, and then also the uh, 
the words uh, that, that we have here from page six, uh, I think it's about three, a, a different three-page study on Christian pacifism as well. Okay, so there's been a lot of requests to cover that particular topic, and I've given you all the tools here to cover it. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's quite a long study, a lot of different Bible verses, and this is the thing that I always try to to uh, do, is if I cannot back things up scripturally, obviously I have no leg to stand on, because my opinion means nothing, if it's going to contradict scripture. And uh, this is what we, we're going to be looking at heavily. So, that actually goes to about page 11 of the PDF, and then there's some Bible verses that... I really believe pertain a lot to what's going on in America, and why this has happened. And if we just look at the whole chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 5, the whole chapter, I'm just going to start reading essentially, uh, where it says, Jeremiah uh, 5, chapter uh, verse 1, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And again, I've emphasized this over and over in the past of God's seeking men, women, that seek truth, that execute judgment, godly judgment. Okay? Not hypocritical judgment where we're judging the speck in our brother's eye and we have a beam in our own. But when a society is abandoned over to wickedness, particularly in the Old Testament, you can look, and a lot, a lot in Isaiah as well, where it says, because there was no pursuit of, of truth, and there was no pursuit of righteousness, and there was no pursuit of, of judgment, um, righteous judgment, then God withdraws his hand from that society. And... What you're going to typically get in most 501c3 corporate churches is, oh, judge not lest you be judged. And they just make this blanket statement and they don't clarify that any. They're not taught, but I'm in reference to biblical judgment, which the church, or what would call itself the church, is totally lacking as far as I can see. And because there is no godly judgment in the church, you've, it's allowed all manner of, of satanic things to permeate into the church, like leaven. And, you know, we have the lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3, Laodicean, Church of Revelation chapter 3, you know, as the norm now. Verse 2, And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. So you can have people saying, Oh, bless God, and the Lord liveth. It's almost like they draw close to me, you know, with their lips, but their heart is far from me, that type of thing. Third verse, O oh Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth. Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Now, God hasn't even really started that in this country yet. But judgment must begin at the house of the Lord, according to the word of God. So, we haven't even got to that phase yet, for the most part. But that's coming, I do believe, from a biblical standpoint. Going further... Therefore I said, surely these are poor, they are foolish, for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. So they don't know the way of the Lord, nor the judgment. Judgment seems to always be emphasized. Godly judgment. Next verse. I will get me unto the great men, I will speak unto them, for they have known the way of the Lord, and the judgment of their God, but these have altogether broken the yoke and burst the bonds. So even these great men who have known God, now they've, they've forsaken God, essentially. Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Everyone that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their, trans their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. I mean, just some of the stuff I've been covering lately about what passes for I guess, biblical behavior in the churches is just, it's incomprehensible. What's going on in so many of these churches? And they glory in their shame, like 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says. They're glorying in the very thing they should be ashamed of. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where it talks about turning such an one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord. I've done a whole study on that. Just key in Satan, I guess, in the ser- keyword search box at contendingfortruth.com. That doesn't get done in the corporate church anymore. I, I don't know if any church that's ever done it that I've ever seen. I'm not saying it never gets done, but I don't think it's hardly ever. Uh, going further, the Lord says, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me, and sworn by them that are no gods, meaning their idols they were worshipping. When I have fed them to the full, they committed adultery. So God fed them to the full, but they rewarded God by committing adultery, essentially in their heart toward God. And assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were actually seen prostitutes, evidently. And they were as fed horses in the morning. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. I don't really want to go into gore detail on that, but I think you probably know what that one means. They were essentially lusting after their neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation... As this, I think it describes America pretty amply at this point. Go ye up on her walls and destroy. Make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord, meaning they have like tried to deceive God, and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. Which is what you typically see in the modern day corporate church. You know, everything's going to be great and wonderful. And, you know, they're not going to speak any kind of truth. Not not all churches, but a lot. The, the majority, I would have to say. It's lukewarm type of uh, teachings. Uh, then they go. it goes on to say, And the prophets shall become wind, the word is not in them, thus shall it be done unto them. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye spent this word, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people wood, and it shall devour them. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. Well, again, just like we had heard the 465,000 NATO troops in the United States under uh, under, uh, NATO troops under treaty. All these foreign troops on these American bases. I've talked a lot about that in in other teachings as well. It reminded me of that. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation, it is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandeth what they say. This is the nation that God says he's going to bring on them. Their quiver is as an open sepulcher, they are all mighty men, and they shall eat up thine harvest and thy bread, which thy sons and thy daughters should eat. They shall eat up thy flocks and thine herds, they shall eat up thy vines and thy fig trees, they shall impoverish thy fenced cities, wherein thou trusteth with the sword. Now again, I, I, like I've already said, God always preserves a remnant. So I'm not sitting here trying to say uh, condemn like my listeners or those types of people, those people that actually know what's going on and aren't, you know, participating in this system. Uh, but I'm just talking about the majority of the what would be termed, I guess, as the 501c3 corporate Church of America. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence? But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of your harvest. Now, it always, it seems like, the main thing that God is seeking in these verses, the main thing that would cause them to repent and get right with God is making the choice to fear God. It says it over and over again. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence? Neither say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord. That's where it all starts. That's why I emphasize that heavily. Fear of God. It's really important to God. (laughs) Okay? 
It's over and over and over again in both the, the Old and the New Testament. But, again, that's not really something that's taught in the, in the churches. It's not pleasant. It's not, you know, it doesn't go along with the whole big guy in the sky, heavenly bellhop God that's preached in so many of the churches. It's blasphemous, though. It's totally irreverent. Let's go further. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. My people are found wicked men. These are like the pastors, I, I, I view, and, and maybe the deacons or the people in leadership. Okay, The hireling pastors that have no true love for the sheep. The uh, pastors that have been brainwashed and ruined in the cemeteries, I mean seminaries of America. You know, they've been taught the tradition of men and have made the word of God of none effect. Taught that, oh, the King James Bible isn't really the word of God. It's it's just a, in fact, there's a much better translation. These corrupted Catholic ones over here that were translated off the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, which spawned all our modern day Bible versions, those are better. They're more scholarly. They're older. They're, so that makes them better. And the word of God so watered down. It's corrupted. And there's so many other things. You know, oh, go get go to the go to the state and get your your license to preach. Where's that in the Bible? Go to the state and get your corporate uh, charter so that you can have a church. Yoke up with the government. Make sure the IRS gives you your right to exist as a church and become a five hundred one c three corporation. Where where's that in the Bible? We're not supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, and I would say, I would dare say that <laughs> yoking your church up and getting the right to exist from the government is uh, pretty much yoking yourself up with a very wicked, evil, unbelieving institution. And as we just talked about with the IRS, you know, you have to abide by their 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 rules. You're supposed to, and a lot of people say, "Well, no, I'm, I I I took the five hundred one c three, but I'm not going to abide by it." Why? You signed the paperwork. You should abide by it if you're gonna if you're gonna enter into contract with somebody. I've done a whole series of teachings on that subject. Just key in five hundred one or five hundred one c three in the search box at contendingfortruth.com if you want to know more about that subject. So going further, for among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. They set a trap. They catch men. They're after your soul. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. The Bible talks about while they, meaning these corrupt preachers, or corrupt people in Christian leadership, while they promise them liberty, promise their followers liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome... The same is brought into bondage. It reminds me of this verse. Because they're brought into bondage. It says that they lay wait. They set a snares. They set a trap. They catch men. Isn't that being brought into bondage? It's the same thing. Just a different way of saying it. As the cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and wax and rich. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, how could... How could Joyce Meyer, who has a $23,000 toilet, and, you know, Creflo give me a dollar, flying his jets all over the place? Or uh, Kenneth Copeland, who has his own airport, and the most high-end private jet you can have, and that's just one of the jets that he has. Ha, they couldn't have got there unless God just blessed them. No, it says right here, it says they are become great and wax and rich. It's because the rich, that was Jesus Christ rich? The Bible says the Son of Man has nowhere to even lay his head. The apostles weren't either. But, you know, they just, people believe what they're told, and, you know, they think that, you know, because they're rich, that makes them godly or something. It's the exact, most of the time, it's the exact opposite. The Bible says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because they that are rich will fall into a many of the temptations. 
And they start trusting in the riches in their strong as their strong tower. They don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ anymore. They're trusting in their riches. That's what usually happens. I'm not saying it always has to happen. But most of the time, that's what happens. So, goes on to say, they are wax and fat, yea, they shine, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. So they don't have any care for orphans, or probably widows. Most of the time, in most of these churches, the benevolent fund is the lowest thing on the totem pole as far as giving goes. They don't even, it's not emphasized. It's about, let's build a bigger building. Let's build bigger edifices and bigger or bigger testament or monuments to, to my greatness. Where in the Bible does it say to do that? They met in home churches in the Bible. They weren't corporations. They didn't have to go anywhere to get some license to preach. They didn't have to get, go somewhere to get a license to have a, uh, a home church or take on some corporate yoke up with the government and take on some corporate uh, status so that they could have a church. None of that. They judge not the cause of the fatherless, fatherless, yet they prosper in the right of the needy. Do they not judge? Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and I would say that would be real common in the charismatic movement. <laughs> I've been there, done it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many bad prophecies I got. <laughs> I mean, tons. That was the norm. I mean, you, you're going to get a word from God? Yeah, right. If it's a word from God, according to Deuteronomy 18, the prophet should be nailing it 100% of the time. Nailing it. And whatever he's telling you should not also contradict the word of God, but confirm it. That's another condition of Deuteronomy uh, 18. If you go back a couple chapters, it gets into that in Deuteronomy. So, that doesn't happen. I can tell you firsthand. Didn't happen with me. I got so many bad supposed words of God. And that was a big thing that started getting my eyes opened to the charismatic movement. And I'm thinking, if this is of God, I've got all these people supposedly giving me all these words of God and this and that. And a lot of times I would try to act on them because they were specific and pointed things. And I would find out they weren't hearing from God. Well, shouldn't that raise red flags? Prophet spoke, a true prophet of God is supposed to be getting it right 100% of the time. And it in the Old Testament, if you didn't have that dynamic happening, you were to kill them. It was a death penalty. It wasn't something you just did lightly. Oh, well, you know, he got it wrong this time, or he gets it right 50% of the time. No, you, you, you're, you're dead. You're stoned. You're, you're... But because there's no real fear of God, and there's no real... Things aren't, aren't uh, policed biblically in the church. With a lot of these churches, just about anything goes. It's like a three-ring circus. I watch videos now of stuff that goes on in the church, and I, a lot of times I just turn it off. I can't even watch it. It's just not because I think I'm so perfect, but it's so irreverent, so unholy, so out of order. The Bible says that in everything should be done in decency and in order in the house of God. The Bible says not to lay hands suddenly on no man, which is a real big one with the Pentecostals. They do that all the time. It's just most of that stuff is ignored. You know, well, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, it feels right. I feel what I think to be the presence of God. Yeah, well, if what you're doing contradicts the word of God, you're not feeling the presence of God. I'm sorry. You're feeling another spirit. But it feels so real. Oh, well, yeah, well, Satan's a really good counterfeiter. Really good. <laughs> so, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, meaning they're doing it their way, and my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof, when judgment We'll begin at the house of the Lord. That's why the Bible talks about the falling away of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 
and that God will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie, that they might all be damned who received not the love of the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's what the Bible predicts. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And in the end time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron in the end times. Okay, that's 1 Timothy 4.1. So, you got to guard your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Just because it feels right or feels good or, or whatever, if it's contradicting the Word of God, get away from it. Get away from it. Now, my opinion's irrelevant. Your opinion's irrelevant if it contradicts the Word of God. Now, if your opinion lines up with the Word of God, then it's a good opinion. That's the gold standard, the Word of God, the, the anvil of truth. So, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and end. Yeah, we're going to kind of switch gears here. We're going to get into some things that they're doing uh, regarding uh, different ways they're trying to take us out physically. Okay, so we're going to get into that in part three. So I'm going to end part two here. We'll go to part three next. God bless you. Up here, where they killed this or they killed that. It's just, okay, let's ignore that and go on to the next, let's go on to the next story. You know, as though, oh, well, that, you know, we, we don't want to associate that with being a Muslim, though. They were just terrorists. Well, the reality is, is it's all lumped together. So, this is how the New World Order media does things. Freedom in a country with an increasingly tyrannical government. To find out if these people are motivated by love of liberty, or as their critics say, by greed, anarchy, and bloodlust, Nightline went deep inside a notoriously press-shy movement. We started here at a diner outside Tampa, Florida. Hey, everybody. How's it going? The first impression was striking. These are not what many of us would expect anti-government extremists to look like. They're diverse, middle-class, educated, and convinced that the government is out of control. But, but come on. Oh, the government is out of control. These are all, all well-dressed uh, average looking people, actually, they look a little more like almost like business like people. These are people that have just figured out, you know, obviously, like we, the situations we look at every week and the, and the news stories we look at every week, they figured out that the government's totally out of control, totally rogue, and they're, and they're starting to band together in order to, um, you know, their strength in numbers and in order to compare notes and in order to, you know, uh, obviously, if everybody's splintered, you know, that's not a typically a good thing. So they're coming together and trying to figure out solutions to a lot of the uh, problems that they're facing. And I'm thinking false arrest, but he tightened up by two clicks, two dice. I brought my right hand up. I said, hold on, hold on, man. I said, you got to loosen up this cuff. You're cutting all my circulation. How dare them? How dare them? Most non-violent. insisted they are nonviolent. But not all of them ruled it out. They set up to be nonviolent. It's not going to get you anywhere. I don't want to come here with this bull crap about trying to impress the news, impress ABC News about how friendly we are. I don't give a crap how friendly anybody is. If they come at me with a gun, I got a gun too. Okay, that's what I'm about. See, but, but again, that's who they're going to want to try. Every other person there, you know, was being real calm. And the one guy that, that spouts off, that's how they're really going to want to try to represent the movement where people are just, you know, itchy trigger fingers and they're just out to, you know. <laughs> but again, that's that's just demonization that they're famous for. Next, we found ourselves at this small church in Center Point, Alabama. Donald Joe Barber, the pastor here, invited us inside for a rare look at a meeting with his congregation of sovereigns. In your view, do you need to have a driver's license? No. Do you need to have license plates? No. What about taxes? Income tax? No. Why not income tax? Because I'm not, I don't live in the United States. Where do you live? I live in the nation Alabama. If you are described as a domestic terrorist in any, any age... And again, somebody hears that, they're not going to have a clue what he's actually talking about. Okay. We'd like to welcome you back to our current event in weekly Bible study for March 11th, 2012. This is part two. 
and we're going to be continuing along in a very similar theme as part one. This is entitled Big Brother Propaganda, Sovereign Citizens, Radicals Exercising God-Given Rights or Fueling Domestic Terrorism. This is from ABC News, a small report, and then I'm going to play the tape, and then we're going to comment on it as well. So, we will do that now. Living outside the law, they are the anti-government extremists next door who believe the laws don't apply to them. No driver's licenses, no taxes. And according to a report out today, these types... Notice how she broad brushes everything. No, No laws apply. No driver's licenses, no tax. She's just trying to paint anyone who would be anti government in the most extremist of the radical of the radical. And 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 again, what ends up happening is, is anybody of any varying degree along those lines would also get lumped in with that group. Why? Because it's so convenient. It's a way to demonize large sex, sections of humanity uh, with you know the most radical elements possibly of that group. And you see a lot of this in the modern modern day media. So so-called hate or anti-government groups grew explosively last year in the U.S. One of the biggest jumps... And you could probably do a 10-part teaching on why he believes what he believes. Okay, But the average person is just going to think he's a nutcase. And again, that's how they want to portray it. They just They give a very small sliver of the story to paint the movement in the worst possible light, and then they just move on and then demonize the whole thing like they're just a bunch of of uh, crazy people. You see, can come and arrest you for domestic terrorism. They can put you away in some holding place until you die under that law. So the way you describe it, this government is totally it, out of control. Absolutely. Yeah. You think we're living in a police state right now? Yeah. Why do you, why do you think so? Well, they think they have all the rights and you have none from the beginning. Barber, who is a former photocopier salesman, has made himself into a scholar of sovereign ideology. A bizarre hobbling together of passages from obscure law books, along with parts of the Constitution and the Bible, all to justify flouting the law. People all over the country are now using sovereign theories to justify failure to repay their debts and even to occupy foreclosed homes. And when police, prosecutors, and judges stand in the way of a sovereign like Donald Barber, they often resort to a classic sovereign weapon called paper terrorism, flooding officials with paperwork. Donald Barber demanded money from this judge. It was a demand for $4 million uh, in gold. Filed a $15 million lien against this judge. Were you angry? Seemingly average people who call themselves sovereign citizens a loose confederation of Americans who can turn violent and have. Here's ABC's Dan Harris with tonight's Nightline Investigates. The federal government considers them a, quote, extremist anti-government group. I hereby challenge this court's jurisdiction as a sovereign. I am not an American citizen. I do not recognize these. I... Sovereign citizens, people who believe the laws of America do not apply to them. They have their own driver's licenses, they have their own hunting licenses, they have their own pistol permits. Violence has gotten this group a lot of attention, but these incidents are really just the tip of the iceberg. This is a movement estimated to be 300,000 strong and growing in every state in America whose members argue they are really patriots, defenders of... And as the government gets more and more rogue, there's going to be more and more sections of the population that feel compelled to join this particular movement. Of course, the vast majority of them aren't doing what is being pictured in this video, where they're going out getting in gun battles with cops. But that's the only... Those are going to be the poster children for the media to represent this group, the most radical... Whereas a Muslim can go and kill and, and, and strap on nail bombs, and you're only going to hear typically about how they're a religion of peace. Even though the reports will 